going to be dismissed to go to Children's Church with Nicole? I don't know. Why is Nicole standing at the back? It's good to have my friend Brandon Maney with us this morning. They let the two of us chaperone teenagers in a dorm room over during camp the last two years.
We will still survive. We can keep going. But he goes on to say, but really, friendship and art, those are the things that give value to this life. While they, while they don't benefit you surviving, they add value to it. Sometimes when you don't feel like putting one foot in front of the other, it's that friend that keeps you going. Matter of fact, I remember going through a combat medic training, and it, it's a very grueling, I don't know, two or three months. <laughs> I, I remember learning about blood clotting and the, and the sergeant teaching the class, because, hey, there's a 16-week med course on this in medical school. I'm going to teach it to you in 30 minutes. And they, they came a whole bunch of information in, and it's really difficult to graduate and pass the coursework. And I remember I was friends with two guys, and we, the three of us said, you are finishing this class. You are going to make it up the other end. The pastor, the Irishman, and the Mormon. <laughs> and there were times where you feel like quitting, you didn't want to study, you didn't want to do things, but the other guy would look at you and say, no, you're going to do it. I'm going to beat you. And I remember as, as we were all going back home, going through our separate units, training was complete. I remember we were standing in the airport, and I remember we looked at each other and said, you know, I don't want to say I couldn't make this, make it through this without you, because that's not true. I could have, I could have made it. But I want to thank you because you, you made, added value to this experience. You made this experience something I will remember. And that's what friends are. But when, when, uh, the honest thing though is, our friends don't do that. When they don't step up and come alongside us and comfort us when we need it. When they come to us with the I told you so speech, don't their words like just for you? I mean, you're already feeling terrible. You're probably already, if you're like me, already beating yourself up enough. When someone comes in the words, I told you so. You should listen. And actually, I would argue in that moment, the words of your friends become the devils in your life. Because you're already broken and beaten down, and they add more to the wounds. And that's really, our, our text this morning is going to be in the book of Job, chapter 27. And that's really what, what's happening with Job here. You see, Job was a man of God. And, and Job, chapter 1, tells us that he was a righteous man of God, that, that God was pleased with the way Job, Job was living his life. And then remember, it says Satan sniffing around heaven one day, and God says, well, hey, have you considered my servant Job? And then Job loses his kids, his job, his fortune. He loses everything in an instant. And over the span of a few hours in one day. So his wife and his friends come to comfort him. Only they don't really comfort him. Matter of fact, his wife says, you know, it gets so bad, his situation in life becomes so dire that his wife looks at him and says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? How can you still follow this God after all this stuff has happened in your life? Job's friends come along and they are so certain that Job has sinned against God somehow that they remind him of him over and over again. If you go back and read the conversation between Job and his friends all the way from, you know, chapter 26 on down, that's the conversation. You see, the Jews believed that if you lived a good, godly life, then God would bless you. And then uh, the, on the flip side, that they also believed that if you lived a sinful life and ignored God and the good ways of God, then God would not bless you. As a matter of fact, bad things would happen to you. But doesn't the story of Job kind of throw a monkey wrench in that whole thought process? Job had done everything right. He lived a life glorifying God, praising God, and in obedience to God, and he lost everything. For those of you who've read the end of the story, you know that he gets no back. 
Job doesn't know that at this moment. All he knows is he's been in this conversation with his three friends over and over again, and they keep trying to say, Job, you must have done something. Stop being so arrogant, Job. Stop pretending that you're sinless, Job. You must have done something because if, if, if you were in right with God, then you would have all your stuff still. So you must have done something wrong. Think about Jeff and Joe's state in that moment. Here's a man who's lost his kids, lost his home, lost all of his money, who's held his family. And instead of his friends coming to him and saying, oh, well, this is what we're going to do from here. It's, you must have done something to upset God. You must, have, you must have done something to make him angry because God doesn't just take stuff away from people. And Job, Job chapter 27 is Job's response. And really throughout the whole book, he, there's a back and forth here. But this, is, this is Job's final discourse. His final statement to his friends. Verse 1. And Job continued his discourse. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made me taste bitterness of soul, as long as I have life within in me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, and my tongue will utter no deceit. I will never admit you are in the right. Till I die, I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach, reproach me as long as I live. May my enemies be like the wicked, my adversaries like the unjust. For what hope has the godless when he's cut off? When God takes away his life? Does God listen to his cry when distress comes upon him? Will he find delight in the Almighty? Will he call upon God at all times? I will teach you about the power of God. The ways of the Almighty I will not conceal. You have all seen this yourselves. Why then this meaningless talk? This is the word of God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Job's at a point in his life where he just, he's going to tell like it is. He's not going to sugarcoat it. He's not worried about whether this is going to affect the relationship or the friendship or not. He's finally had enough of the words of his friends that he's just going to fly out tell them how it is. One thing I find interesting about this story and up until this point, God knows exactly what's happening with Job. He knows Job is righteous. He knows Job's friends are falsely accusing him. Yet not once does God speak up to this point and defend Job before his friends. Not one time. God doesn't appear and say to, to those other three guys, hey, leave my servant Job alone. No, Job just keeps going through. And as Job is going through this, Job is certain of one thing. He is certain that the God he has been faithful to will prove himself faithful to him. And then you think about yourself when you're in Job in this situation. Job's lost everything. His wife is hurling tough questions at him. His friends are questioning his integrity. And the God that he's been following is doing nothing to speak on his behalf to clear up this whole mess. And yet Job has enough faith in this moment to say, my God will stand up for me. He has absolutely no evidence to the contrary at this point. He has nothing to prove his case before his friends that he's innocent. The, the only thing that he can say to his friends is that I, I, am a, I have not sinned against God. I know my walk with God. I know where I've been. I know what I've said. I know the things that I have done. And I can honestly tell you that there is no sin in my life between God and I. 
But then it's his word against theirs. It's Job's word against the tradition of their understanding of, of, well, you know, you must have done something wrong because God didn't just take stuff away from you. That's the evidence against it. And really, if we're looking at Job, and we're looking at it as a, as a Jewish person at this story, but they're understanding. There is nothing that packs up Job's claims. Yet Job holds on to God and says, My God will defend me. My God will justify me. My God will speak on my behalf. God, you wait and see. God's going to show you that I am right. And Job vows in verses 1 through 6 that the breath that God had given him. And, and notice God, Job doesn't even sugarcoat what God's doing in his life. In verse 2 it says, As truly as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty, who has made me the taste of bitterness of souls, he's recognizing God's hand in all this. But at the same time, he recognizes that it was God who gave him the gift of life. The very breath in his lungs. And as long as he had that breath, that gift that God had given him, Job's one thing was going to be, he was going to glorify God with the speech. He was going to speak of God in his life. And he was going to maintain his own innocence before him. Verses 7 to 10. May my enemies be like the wicked, my adversaries like the unjust. For what hope has the godless when he is cut off, when God takes away his life? Does God listen to his cry when distress comes upon him? Will he find delight in the Almighty? Will he call upon God at all times? This is Job realizing that this understanding that he's grown up with. This tradition of knowledge that his friends are operating under is wrong. Before all this had happened in his life, Job would have agreed with his friends that were there confronting him. But in this moment, the light bulb goes off and he realizes, I've done nothing wrong. trying to distract him and pull him away from God. 
You see, because if Job spoke up and if he said, you know what, maybe you guys are right. Maybe there's something unchecked sin in my life. Maybe I should check and, and stop and go and search myself and things like that. He could have said all that. He could have given the good Sunday school answer. But Job in his heart knows that's not the, that's not the truth. Job knows himself. Job knows he's made it his lifelong purpose to pursue God and to live for Him. And for him in this moment to just to agree with his friends to shut them up and get them to go away, he would be not denying his own integrity. So here he is, he's, he's calling out his friends. As he's un unlearning all he had been taught and all he had known growing up, and as he's beginning to realize that, that, that God blesses both the, the righteous and the unrighteous. Somehow, some way, somehow it works out that way. That somehow, you know, just because you're good doesn't mean that it's all going to be smooth sailing, that you're going to have money in the bank, and, and God's going to take care of your family. And sometimes the person that does wickedness gets all those things. And he's deconstructing that. Now he's challenging that his, his, his new understanding with that. He's taking it to his friends and he's challenging them with it. I will teach you about the power of God, the ways the Almighty I will not conceal. You have seen all, you have all seen this yourselves. Why didn't this meeting was talk? Job tells him, hey, God's power is on display right here. I know what you think. I know what you've been taught growing up, that if you do good things, then God's going to bless you with good things. But I'm here to tell you, that isn't true. And if we look throughout all of Scripture up to this point, we begin to see a picture that you know, following God does not guarantee us a smooth sailing ride. In Sunday school with the teens, we talked about Joseph today, didn't we, Chris? Shake his head. Thanks, man. Joseph's in Potiphar's house. The Egyptian ruler, the, the Egyptian guy he's working for. And he's doing everything right. He's, he's serving his master. He's doing it to the best of his ability and to the point where the master, Potiphar, is giving him more and more responsibility. More and more things he's in charge of. And then what happens? In comes Potiphar's wife. That wasn't Joseph's fault. No, it wasn't. It wasn't Joseph's fault that the scripture describes him as handsome and good looking? It wasn't his fault that, that the Potiphar's wife took notice of that and and decided to pursue some, a relationship with him that was outside the bonds of marriage that God had created? That wasn't 
wasn't Joseph's fault. Yet here he is in that situation. And when the temptation really comes to an end, that woman's got him cornered in that room. And, and what does he do? He, he, just, he just leaves everything behind. He's like, you know what? I am not going to sin against my master. I'm not going to sin against my God. I am out of here. He drops everything and he runs. He runs away. He gets out of there. And then Paul first wife is, tells this story, right, of, well, he tried to break me. This Hebrew you brought into my house, he tried to harm me. Joseph didn't do anything wrong in that story. Those were just the events of his life, the way they played out. And the way his life played out, the, the thanks he got from God was he ended up in jail for a crime he didn't commit. Now we know that God works together all works together all things for good of those who love Him. But that situation was not good. And the one thing we know about God, the one thing that Scripture tells us over and over again, is that God doesn't sin. He will never ask us to sin. He never say, well, it's okay if you sit here because I need you to do this to fulfill my plan. He, he never says that. He never justifies the means for the outcome. But what about that verse in Romans? Like when you exploded. That means that God's going to, it doesn't mean that God magically takes, takes it like a bold lucky charms and turns it into something good. If you got raped, it's still bad. There's nothing good about it. There's nothing okay about it. But God says, no, you know what? That moment is not going to ruin your whole life. That problem you just dealt with, that wasn't your fault. It's not going to define you. I'm going to take that and make it a piece of your story. I will work in it for your good, but you have to be willing to surrender and let me work in it. God's power is on display, but, could, but what if Job's friends see that? Could they see the truth behind it all? Could they realize that the words that they, they did, that they were saying to Job were not comforting him at all? They weren't helping him. And, and quite honestly, I would argue that they weren't listening to what Job was saying either. God's truth was visible, but could they see it? God was distilling this notion that if you do good things, if you if you do if you do good before God, God will do good things for you. God was destroying that idea. Because quite honestly, you know, we go through this life as Christians sometimes acting like God owes us something. And actually, I love our district superintendent because a part of our uh, district assessment, he brought that up. He goes, just because you complete all the courses for the course of study doesn't guarantee you're going to be ordained. Just because you held your local license for two years, like the manual says, does not mean you're going to be on the path of ordination. Ordination isn't a right, it's a privilege. And how that relates to us with God is you realize that God did not have to give you life. God did not have to breathe his life into you, but he did. God doesn't owe you a thing. Everything that you have, everything that you are, all the good things that have happened in your life, all the ways that, that where it looked like triumph, the evil is going to triumph over you and stop you, those victories that, that helped you overcome those moments, those were of God too. And I want you to understand, God did not have to do that. He's not obligated to. There's no one up in heaven saying, God, you have to do this for this person. He did it simply because he loved you and he could. And 
And Job understood that. He understood the fact that God, the very fact God had given him breath, that was enough for him. He knew he was innocent before God. He told his friends that over and over again. But he couldn't make him see. And he couldn't force God to respond. He just had to faithfully wait. And then I'm back into this person says, You have all seen this yourselves. Why then this meaningless talk? Job points out to his friends, You have seen all this happening. You know who I am. You've witnessed my life. We've been friends for a long time. We've walked this road together. Then why is all this hot air coming out of your head? Why is all this vanity lace vanity coming from your mouth? <laughs> so what's in all this for us? At some point in your life, you're going you're gonna to think you're joking. If you're following Jesus at all, at some point you're going to feel like you're Maybe not to a degree. But you're going to relate to him. And you know you're standing before God. But let's be honest. We, when we wake up in the morning and we look in the mirror, we know that we are before God. It's not a secret. He doesn't hide it from us. He doesn't sugarcoat it to make us feel better about ourselves than what we are. He just, he, God's just on us. He says, you are, you are who you are. This is where you're at. This is what we're working on with you. My spirit's going to help you get past this. My spirit's going to grow you beyond this. But right now, this is where you're going. And some of you, you have some bad stuff going on in your life right now. Stuff is not your fault. Stuff that's just bad that happens. Stuff that just happens because we live in a broken, messed up world. And at some point, someone's going to come to you and say, well, I told you so. They're going to come to you and be like Job's friends and whisper words to you that hurt. They've looked at a very small piece of your life and they've defined you off of your entire existence off that one moment. And they're going to be like, the, the words going to be like the devils that's get stuck in your head that won't go away. And you, you know the words I'm talking about. They're the words that, that keep you up at night. Whispering, saying, well, you know, I know, I know you think you're saved, but maybe you're not. You know, because if, if you're really saved, if God really loved you and cared about you, you wouldn't let stuff like that happen to you. You know, if God really loved you and cared about you, you know, maybe, you know, you would be more like person so-and-so down the street. Well, maybe if you were really saved like you said you were, maybe God really loved you like you think he does, maybe that would happen. That's not the voice of God, friends. That's not the voice of God whispering to you. That's not the voice of God talking to you. No. It's that slither old serpent. It's that liar and accuser. Trying to get you to look at God wrong. So what do we do in those moments? How do we overcome the devils that get stuck in our hearts and minds? And, and I think Job gives us a great demonstration. He says, stay. If you look at what Job does, Job's response in this is he stakes everything on God. He doesn't look to his circumstances. He doesn't look to his possessions. He doesn't look to his health. He doesn't look to his church. He looks to God and he says, my God will justify me. My God will defend me. My God knows the truth about me. And he takes that stand. And, there is, and he is so determined. 
He is so ready to persevere in the faith that there is nothing that's going to shake his confidence in the fact that God loves him, that God's in control of the situation, and that God's going to get with him through it. God's going to get him through it. Take your words, jump them together, makes sense. Job understood that to be without God has more. It, 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 yes, to be without God means that you 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 are destined for eternal damnation. If you're without God in your life, you're going to hell. There's no way of sugarcoating it. There's no way around it. There's Bible passage after Bible passage. That's what it says. You can't ignore that. But Job understood something. He understood. That eternal life have more to do with heaven and hell. Do you realize that? Eternal life is not just about heaven or hell. It's not about that was the question we always ask. Do you, do you know if you go to heaven when you die? It's more than that question. He understood that, you know what? This faith in God thing is. This eternal life thing starts the moment I, I take my first breath. Because it's God who gave it to me. My entire existence is to be eternally before God and faith in Him. All of my actions should flow from that presence of Him inside my life. All of my words that I say should be something that reflects Him. And as Job wrestled with that thought, the other thing that comes out that you see him to start to understand in verses 7 through 10 is that person who doesn't know God. Not only are they destined for eternal damnation, but they're destined for a life without a hope or faith. Because Job understood that living eternally for God meant that God lived with you. God's presence lived with you in this life. Wherever you went, whatever you did, God's presence went with you. It worked in you and through you. But a person that doesn't know God doesn't have that. They don't have a guaranteed future after this life. And they have no guaranteed hope in the midst of it. Job took everything on God. He said, my God will take care of me. I, I, my fear is sometimes the church we lose sight of that. It, it, really, at the center of our message is Jesus. No matter what other, put any doctrine in in our manual or in that's defined throughout all Christendom, and it all leads you back to Jesus. Yet when we deal with people of the world that are lost, we'll take them to their sin and say, well, look what you did there. Look what you did there. Do you realize that broke commandment number eight? You've got to fix yourself. You've got to make this right. You've had to stop living this way and start living your life for God. That's how we respond. And don't, don't tell me I'm wrong because that's exactly how we respond. But do you realize that we cannot fix ourselves? Do you realize as a sinner you cannot stop sinning? You do not have the power within your ability, in your being, you do not have the ability to stop yourself from sinning because it's in the very definition of who you are. The word sinner means someone who sins. So when you look at that person and say, you broke commandment number nine. You have to stop and fix yourself. 
They can't. You can't make enough rules to get them to change. What would happen if we as the church though we changed our, our mindset? What if we stopped pointing at the sinner and pointing at their sin and saying, you did this fix it? What if we said, you know what, I recognize that tear sinner, but you know what, I know this man named Jesus. I know this man, Jesus, who, who gave the blind men their sight, who gave the deaf man the ability to hear. Something like that. I know this Jesus who died on the cross, so that, and, so, and his blood has washed your sins away, so that you are forgiven. All you have to do is ask him, and you can be set free. His resurrection will give you the power to not just be free from, to, to quit sinning. His, his, his resurrection knowledge and it proves that you're forgiven. It gives you the ability to live above it because he sends your spirit into you so you don't have to live that way anymore. What if we did that, church? What if instead of saying, you broke broken man number nine, saying, yeah, you know what? But God loves you. He has a plan for you that doesn't have to define you. He can pick you up, change you around, transform you, and make you into a new creation. What if we did that, church? See, this stake everything on God. It doesn't just mean for the unbeliever. It doesn't just mean for the person that's stuck in, in, in the middle of life's terribleness. It means for all of us. What if we all focused on God and pointed people back to God that way? And I'm not talking about, well, if you, break, if you commit this sin, you're going to hell. What if it's, yeah, you know that's true? If you don't change your ways, you're going to hell. But you know what? You don't have to do that. There, there, do you realize God gave us a clause? It's, yes, you will go to hell if you don't repent. However, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Well, what if we actually believe that and live that church? Drugs take everything on that. But one thing we know about sin, one thing we know about this life is that always is a mess. No matter how good a Christian you are, when you go through a dark time in your life, it leaves a mess in your life, doesn't it? But whose job is it to straighten all that out? Whose job is it that someone that to clean that mess up? Whose job is it to come back in and put everything back right again?
And we have a God that has the power to silence the devils in our hearts and our minds. James 4, 7 says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I know that's talking about the actual adversary, the one called the devil. But I wonder, I wonder if that same concept applies to those words that are stuck in our hearts and our minds. Minds and our hearts. You know, would that really work? If we submitted to God and resisted the devil, he would flee from us? We stop listening to those voices in our heads and saying we don't belong to God, that God doesn't love us, that God is, isn't there for us, that God's not there. If we stop listening to that and submitted to Him, Him and His will, do you, do, you, do you think that would stop? Do you think God would give us the power to overcome that? You see, Job stood firm in the faith and pointed to God. That one point something about his friends. Not one time did Job's friends do that. Not one time does Job's friends come to him and say, and point to the power of God in his life. No, they keep pointing to Job and saying, you must have done something. You must have messed up somewhere. You must have done something you weren't supposed to. So how do so we, we, we submit to God? Matthew Henry says, Truth, rightly understood and applied, will cure us of all that vanity of mind which arises from our mistakes. It's like Jim is saying, the truth will set you free. That's what we need, folks, the truth. If all heads bowed and eyes closed. morning and you've been beaten down by the devils in your life. And this morning you said, enough is enough. I want to recognize the power of God in my life. I want to submit to Him and, and see what His power can do. That's you this morning. Just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Amen. Maybe this morning as you've been sitting here you're thinking about things you've said and things you've done. in your scriptures that you've given to us. You speak to so many things in our life. So many things about who we are, Lord. You know sometimes the things that hurt us the most. The things that distract us and point us away from you the most are the words of the words of the friends. Who in their heart they have the best of intentions. Lord, they love us and they want to see us fight with you. They love us and want to see that we belong to you. But God, sometimes we know they're misjudging and misreading the situation. And Lord, you know the pain and the heartache that's caused us. You know the sleepless nights that we've endured because of what they've said or what they've done. Lord, we recognize that their words and their actions have become weapons of the enemy used to beat us down and take our eyes off you. Oh, Lord, would you help us today? Lord, help us to submit to your truth and your will for our lives. And as we cling to James 4, 7 today, knowing that when we submit to you, the devil will flee. Lord, would you replace his lies and the virtue that says we are loved, the 
that you have a plan for us, that this doesn't have to define us, that this isn't the end of who we are, that, this, that our existence doesn't stop here. Oh God, will you give us our, our spirit as we face the days ahead and we, we wrestle with this God. As you begin to renew our mind to the power of your spirit. Lord, maybe there's some of us here this morning that we've used words that are lingering. We didn't intend to attempt that now. Sometimes, Lord, in our fallen state, we don't recognize that we were created in your image. And part of being created in your image, Lord, is our words have power. And while our words don't create worlds and things like that, God, our words can build up and destroy. And Lord, once they're spoken, you know sometimes we immediately regret it and we wish we could have them back, but we can't. I pray, Lord, you, you would forgive us for those moments. Would your spirit bring healing to the person that we've spoken with you? May this be a moment that is weaved into our story that you change, change and transform for our good, God. And for their good. Lord, keep us as we go home. Bless the time of fellowship that follows. In your name I pray. Amen. Right, so here's the plan. Uh, if you're staying to pass out candy for the children, uh, I, we'll, we'll, we'll gather these, these two in this hallway, and just grab your bag of candy, and uh, as soon as Nicole's ready, they'll, they'll parade past us, and we'll pass the candy out to them. So.